Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, Thanksgiving week went fine. Um, Amy went to town with the cooking and prep all week, and uh, I did a modicum of house cleaning and, and other stuff, and uh, and a couple of friends came over for the for a great meal and fun conversation on the, the day itself. I um, I had a good time. I, it was good to see friends, and, uh, and I hope you all had a, a good and or easy time of it, too. But that is all the intro you're going to get this time because I really want to dive right into this week's conversation. My guest is the legendary illustrator and cartoonist and artist Edward Sorrell, who has a wonderful new memoir out from Knopf called Profusely Illustrated. Ed, um, Ed has had a Pantheon level career. Really, he's had a, a couple of Pantheon level careers, uh, political cartoonist, portraitist, magazine illustrator slash caricaturist of, of literary and Hollywood figures, uh, children's book artist and, and writer, and, and now in his, well, started in his late 80s into his 90s, author. Uh, his first full-length book, Mary Astor's Purple Diary, is an amazing piece of work. It, it blends memoir and history and his love of the, well, of a certain era of cinema with just absolutely dazzling drawings. And that one came out in 2016. You really ought to give it a read. Now, his new one, Profusely Illustrated, um, like I say, it's a memoir that tells his story, but also dives deep into his his political cartoons and his take as a well as a young lefty turned into old lefty on the administrations presidential administrations he's witnessed over his, his 92 years um also you guys know that 50s and 60s new york city is just catnip for me and Ed tells some great stories in the book about that era when he was co-founding Pushpin Studios with Seymour Quast, building a career in the, the magazine and advertising world, um, and just working with other legendary figures who I have had the great, great fortune of recording with, like Seymour, Milton Glaser, George Lois, and, and the like. Now, Ed also writes about his personal life throughout the book, including his first marriage and its dissolution, uh, his children, life in the country and the city, and just the magic of his, his second marriage to a woman named Nancy Caldwell. His love for her, it's almost tangible as he, he writes about it. And the, the sadness of losing her a few years ago as her health declined is, is, well, to me, it was just devastating, but, you know, maybe I'm a, a little oversensitive about that sort of stuff nowadays. I will say um, there is also, as if written just for me, a chapter about Ed's friends. It's just called Friends, and it's filled with plenty of anecdotes about literary publishing and, and artistic figures he's known over the years. And you can call it name dropping, but I just loved it. But most importantly, uh, profusely illustrated chronicles Ed's development as an artist and the way his his love of drawing got beaten out of him by the, the wave of abstractionism during his formative years, which we'll talk about during the show, and how he managed to develop and, and refine the frantic, sketchy style that, that would become his, his trademark. And the art on display in the book, there's like 170 uh, pieces of art in this, uh, the art on display demonstrates how utterly unique Ed's work is. And and it's amazing to see how it developed and how he learned to to go with such a dynamic line and to, to trust the picture that would emerge. Um, you'll see it. You'll understand what I mean. You look at his work and and it's unlike anyone else's. And it's it's so truthful in what he does 
And while we talk about that and what the process is like for him, um, as well as some of the challenges of not being able to find the right size paper anymore. But anyway, that's all going to come up in the conversation. Um, He does write about one of the key moments in his his art and his career when he had to make an illustration for Esquire's legendary cover story, Mr. Sinatra Has a Cold. Um, And what's ironic about that is Ed had to postpone our pre-Thanksgiving podcast session because he had a cold. And I was afraid this episode was going to be all about how we never managed to get together and I was going to do a a write around podcast about it. But luckily, Ed rallied for a post Thanksgiving pod date, um, even though his lingering cold made him sound a little like Walter Brennan, as, as he puts it. Anyway, profusely illustrated is an absolute joy to read and to see such a collection of Ed's work over more than half a century. Um, his political commentary in both the drawings and his prose, because he he gets into, um, well, each of the past 12 presidencies, it helps put our present moment in perspective also. And a present moment is sort of talking backwards about the previous four years, but also, you know, where we are as a country and where we are as a people. Um, Ed's seen a lot. His political insights are are pretty impressive, although he does complain about the amount of research he had to do for that portion of this book. Anyway, beyond all that, anyone who has listened to me gab knows that Ed Sorrell, someone who has built a career and and kept a unique style for for all these years, is just my sort of dream guest. Um, The idea that an artist of his stature, that other artists of his stature would give me a couple of hours of their time, it just never fails to amaze me. Um, getting to, to sit down with people from his era, like like Ed, uh, Milton, Seymour, Jules Pfeiffer, R.O. Blackman, George Lois, and, and others, it's just given me so much joy over the years, and I, I hope you get something out of these conversations, too. Uh, now, also, as an aside, I should tell you that after we wrapped, Ed and I talked for a while more, and I had my sketchbooks with me. I got a larger one and the little tiny sketch pad I use because I have learned to always take them along because I might want to draw something. And Ed flipped through my stuff, which you guys know I just started this year in drawing, and I'm I'm I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but. Um, when I saw him flip to a page and say, ooh, that's a good one, and, and kind of light up, uh, that just left me walking on clouds for the last couple of days. In this case, the first one was one of the Greyhound drawings I did a couple of weeks ago um, that just sort of captured what it's like for a, a Greyhound at rest. Um, anyway, I, I that's just one of my little moments of joy. Um, now, as caveats go, uh, Ed and I did record in person. It's in New York City, so there were street noise, sirens, car horns, all that stuff. Uh, I also had to make a couple little edits that I hope aren't too jarring. Oh, and Mr. Sorrell had a cold. Oh, uh, one other thing. I know I'm going on too long, but I want to thank Graydon Carter, uh, former editor editor at Vanity Fair, for um, telling me to keep pushing Ed about recording a podcast because I tried a few years ago and at the time Ed was having some uh, some health stuff and, and declined. Um, but Graydon basically said, yeah, don't worry, just keep pushing. You know, he'll say yes eventually. Um, I do have a funny story about this whole anecdote about bumping into Graydon Carter at the Ottawa airport. I'll fill you in on that next time we get together. Now, here's Ed's bio. This is the short version from the book. There is a longer version at his website, edwardsorrell.com. Edward Sorrell's work has appeared in many, many places, among them Vanity Fair, The Atlantic, The Nation, and The New Yorker, for which he has done numerous covers. He lives in New York in the apartment that he shared with his wife and sometime writing partner, Nancy Caldwell Sorrell. And now... The Virtual Memories Conversation with Edward Sorrell. Tell me about Profusely Illustrated. How did it come about? What was the the origins of the... Well, that's an interesting origin, actually. Uh, Robert Carroll is is a fan. He... I did... I illustrated... uh, part of his book in the New Yorker and uh, and and we had a mutual friend Kathy Horrigan was uh, 
is the managing editor at Knopf, and she did the first run through of his book. Uh, and then Bob Gottlieb did the final editing on it. But it was, so we became friends through Kathy Horrigan, and, and then I gave him one of the illustrations that I did <clears throat> about Lyndon Johnson that I did for uh, one of the Philadelphia papers. And, um, and so we became, you know, sort of friends. I was invited to his annual New Year's party, and uh, he suggested to my editor at Knopf that she do a book of my political stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, knowing that such a book would not sell, she, <laughs> she suggested that I <clears throat> turn it into a memoir. And when I uh, when I reminded her that I had read a re led a remarkably unremarkable life, uh, she said, "Yeah, but you've lived a long time and uh, you you've seen a lot." So uh, so we signed we signed a contract to do my profusely illustrated, and and the thing that I wanted to get off my chest much more than my life was the terrible, terrible presidents that I have lived through. You literally chronicle life. every single one since FDR. You, you yeah, every, everyone, to... uh, er, everyone, I mean, not that FDR was, was blameless and a saint, but he was a great president. Uh, and uh, but you start with Truman and but literally, after Truman and yeah. after that it was all garbage yeah. and worse than that sometimes and um, so I I say at the beginning of my book that I'm going to interrupt the narrative to tell you what your presidents were, really did and and then I began to regret it because. It was, oh, I had to do a lot of research. I lived through Ronald Reagan. I knew I knew what a terrible, terrible guy he was, but I had no idea that that he was responsible for actually genocide in in uh, Guatemala, and uh, and so so I had to do this stuff. It was painful to read. It was painful to write about. But I did promise my readers that I would not devote more than two pages to them. <laughs> you had to limit yourself to the number right. of horrible things yeah, some of them did. Right. Yeah. And uh, so, so that was that was how the book took shape. I, so it was a rather discombobulated book. It was about my life, which I was happy to talk about, and uh, <clears throat> and it was about these politicians, and it was about my art and uh it took a long time because uh i'm i i never took any lessons about writing i d don't know what i'm doing but I, I just try to make it as conversational as possible and uh and that's that's how the book came about yeah. and that's what editors are for you know they can they can help shape things you know Somewhat, but but I, I like the book for that very reason. That that conversational style is a lot better than a you know august distance and uh -huh. you know and then I spoke down to you know yeah. you you get across what it was like. Yeah. Now, was it difficult? I don't want to say difficult. You know, were there difficulties in either revisiting you know past work of yours or you know recounting aspects of your life from you know the ninety years? Well, I, I left out. Uh, I showed the bad work I did yeah. when I started out. Mm -hmm. As I make, made clear in the book, I loved doing drawings as a child that told a story, that had people, there was incident, there was... Uh, and, and then I went to music and art, and I remember the first art lesson I got when I went to music and art was draw a face uh, and then divide it in half and then make planes in the face and 
and draw and color each plane in the face differently. So they weren't teaching you how to draw, they were teaching you how to become an abstractionist. Yeah. And from that point on, from the four years at Music and Art and the three years at Cooper Union, which at that time was just a diploma granting institution, not a degree granting, and um, I, I, I had gone to schools that had would only accept abstract art. And all I wanted to do was draw. And to them, especially at Cooper Union, illustration was considered what was done at, on the, at the Saturday Evening Post with Kobe Whitmore and Al Parker and mm. all those other doing romantic two people kissing in different poses. Yeah. And, um, and so actually by the time I graduated Cooper Union, I literally could not draw. I could only abstract. I could make I could make a bowl of fruit or or a locomotive or anything you wanted into an abstraction. Uh, Stuart Davis was was our role model. Mm -hmm. And uh and when I started Pushpin Studios with Seymour. Of course, all the obituaries and everything else says that I, I started the book with Milton Glaser and Seymour Quast. And of course, Milton Glaser always got top billing at in in every case. It, it wasn't true. I started, I started Pushpin Studios with Seymour because we both got fired on the same day from Esquire magazine. And uh, and I convinced him that the Pushpin Almanac, which we had started as a promotion piece, every, all the other freelance artists were making blotters for some reason uh, with their phone number on one side and the blotter on the other. Uh, and that didn't seem to make much sense to me since everybody was using ballpoint pens. Uh, and uh, so, so the the Pushpin Almanac w made a big hit with everybody, especially Seymour. Seymour got work from it. My style had no commercial value whatsoever, so of course I didn't get any work. And I was the outside man. I was the guy who showed the portfolio, and Seymour was the guy. Seymour constituted all of Pushpin Studios. Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, Reynold Ruffins, who had an outside job, was the third member, uh, but he really wasn't. Yeah, in you, the you, you sort of frame him as a, you know, willing to, to lend a hand. Yeah, but he, not a, yeah he was willing yeah. to lend a hand, but yeah. we, he wasn't. He had enough work. It was, it was, Se it was really Seymour's talent that, that started Pushpin Studios. And, um, and it was easy. Uh, it was easy uh, being being the outside man. You saw five or six art directors a day, and you brought in. I usually brought in a job for Seymour. I didn't get any. I carried my stuff in the portfolio, but it was that two dimensional design crap mm -hmm. that uh, <clears throat> that had no value whatsoever. So. Um, was, then Milton returned from his Fulbright in Bologna in Italy and um, and he wanted to be part of the studio because we were succeeding already I mean we were getting jobs um, and uh, I didn't I didn't want him but uh, Seymour realized that it would he would be an asset so it became the three of us. And uh, and I have to admit that I was the least talented <laughs> of the three of them. I did I did not know how to draw. When we did our the first Pushpin Almanac, we the it was a four it had four pages. There was a a French fold, so it looks like we had eight pages, but it was really it was really a four page almanac, and. And the last page was devoted to our advertisers, the typographer and the printer. And and there was room for a little line drawing. And I couldn't do a line drawing anymore because I had 
for seven years, I had been learned to work in shapes. It, it was really such a cruel... Well, I mean, I didn't have a choice of, of which art school to go to. My friend Jim McMullen went to Pratt, and he learned, and he had life classes all the time. I didn't, there weren't, I remember one life class in the entire three years that I was there. There, there was no emphasis on drawing. And who would teach it to us? All the art teachers were abstractionists. So, uh, I mean, it isn't that I don't, I mean, my, my, Favorite artists are, are the German Expressionists. It's Max Beckman and Alice Neal, and uh, and I I love I I love modern art. I just have no no empathy with a, a pure abstraction. Yeah. I mean, all I keep thinking of is Saul Steinberg's cartoon of a woman crying while looking at. A Mondrian painting. Uh, I mean, some people have great emotional contact with shapes. I'm not one of them. Did the did that study at all help when it came to when you went when you finally were able to return to figurative drawing with composition or or you know was there any well, benefit I to learned, any of that stuff other than I, you, know? I, you pick stuff up in the street so to speak like one art director said you know your silhouette is bad in other words there was a scene with people it was a the picture was a square uh, uh, but the people in the square made a bad silhouette. So mm -hmm. from that point on, I suddenly realized there is such a thing as a silhouette yeah. inside a picture. And uh, and you you pick things up like that. But I had to, uh, I had to, well, I learned, I, I am most responsible to Milton and Seymour for helping me return to drawing. Yeah. It, it sounds like they sort of, in the book, it, it sounds like they press ganged you into it with a, yeah, yeah we need your hands here. Strip, so, and, and, yeah. they, and they needed somebody to do, uh, to do it. And, and that was, I, I had, drawing was effortless to me once upon a time. From that, uh, when I relearned how to do it, it was no longer effortless. I really had to work at relearning how to draw, and then relearning how to draw spontaneously and freely because I I loved doing comic art. And and when, when you were a little kid, did you want to do a comic strip? I did do a comic strip. Yeah, yeah, I did Dick Tracy, but I made up my own. That's what story. I mean. Did, was yeah. that your your? I don't say career goal when you're an eight year old, but you know, was that a? No, my career goal by the time I was ten years old, <clears throat> and went to an art school on Saturdays at the Little Red Schoolhouse that was sponsored by uh, by one of the Vanderbilts, Gertrude Vanderbilt, and. Uh, <clears throat> And I, every every week I would stop off at the Whitney Museum, which was on 8th Street, and I'd look at John Sloan and uh, and Reginald Marsh and Prendergast and all the others. And my goal was to, when I was able to, when I grew up, I would do the kind of paintings that John Sloan was doing. I loved them. Mm -hmm. His paintings of... the people on the Staten Island Ferry, uh, people uh, at McSorley's. Those paintings moved me. I, I, they were full of humanity. And uh, Well, I, I grew up... I grew up at a period that when you went into a bank, they had innocuous pictures of beautiful landscapes or still lifes, and now when you go into a bank, you see abstraction. And because that is, that is what people accept as... Wallpaper. As, as, yeah. yeah, it's... So, it's a different world now. And, uh, 
And I think every old person turns into a nostalgia buff. It was it, everything was wonderful then, even though even at fifty. Trust me. Yeah, I look at it, the goddamn kids today. You know, they, they yeah. don't understand what it was like before an internet. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah. Uh, let me ask. I, being artistically inclined as a kid, I mean, you, in the book you talk about, you know, um, not a great relationship with your dad, but, you know, the other school kids, was there any, you know, you're the art kid and, and you were, um, was it a problem or was it any sort of, you know, oh, he's the kid who can draw stuff for us? No, uh, I was the kid that you never picked for your baseball team. Yeah, well, there's always that, you know. <laughs> Kickball you know, was the I, other one. <laughs> yeah. I remember there was there was one day when the the when a sub, when we had a substitute teacher and he had to take us to to gym class and uh, and he had and the and he had to. He had to pick the captain of the, of, of a team. So because I was tall, I was picked as the captain, as the one of the team. And and the, all the cla- all the boys went, oh, oh. no, no. <laughs> Little did he know. Yeah. Little did he know that I was a sissy. Yeah. You don't pick him. He can't catch. He can't throw. He can't do anything. Uh, so, uh, no, I was I was yeah. I was always solitary. Uh, you know, the the parents were out working, and I, I'd come home alone, and I'd make pictures. I would would never do my homework. I just wanted to make pictures, and uh, and and pictures are a much better way of avoiding the world than anything I know. I, even today, drawing pictures, you really it really takes you away from everything. Do you draw anything for... Do you draw on your own at this point, or is everything no, still... I haven't done anything for, for myself, except birthday cards for friends yeah. and things like that. Because I remember but, an interview with you like 20-something years ago where it was, if there's not a purchase order, I'm not drawing. That's right. Is it still the... the yes, the I did <laughs> say that. Yeah. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I've, like I've, I've mentioned, I started drawing this year and I have literally the exact opposite. I'm like, I couldn't imagine anyone giving me money for anything. So I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to draw on my own and, and you know, I yeah. got my trees and, and statues. I, I get angry when people ask me, uh, do I do art on my own? But, you know, the comic art I do is my art. That's yeah. it's my art form. Yeah. Uh, I like doing funny stuff, and every once in a while, they turn out well, and uh, they make me happy. Yeah, that's... It actually raises a question, and we're jumping all over the goddamn place, but political cartooning, the old Hollywood illustrations, Mm -hmm. you know, were there areas you... What did you enjoy more, I suppose, as far as, you know... The people you you just... well, I guess what I enjoyed most of all was <clears throat> the year or two that I that the nation gave me a, a page of my own, mm-hmm. and 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 because they promised me that I could do whatever I wanted, I did a lot of autobiographical cartoons. Yeah. And I really that was the third thing I was going to ask. Was it the the, the self driven oh. stuff instead? Because those are just a joy. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, I, the, I enjoyed those most of all. Yeah. yeah, I will note. I was just reading one down the hall here in your apartment um, where you sell your soul never to get another cold. Uh, but apparently that didn't work out because you've, you've still got the cold I now. I still <laughs> got it. Yeah, yeah. That was, you know, nobody understood that cartoon. Yeah. Uh, and including Graydon Carter. Graydon Carter liked my drawings, and uh, and I sent I sent this thing in, and he, he gave me a page for it. But it, it, that cartoon combined my love of movies and, and Conrad Veidt. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it was great fun. But I, I, I think I'm the only one who really understood that cartoon. <laughs> But, uh, Had you wanted to do longer form comics, you know, not like Jules doing, you know, two hundred page graphic novels, but uh, no, I, but a single I, page or nine panel was was good for you. I'm very slow. I, I, it takes me a long time to do comic strips, 
that I find comic strips. I, I'm, I don't know how those guys who do the superhero stuff do it. I mean, to me, that would take me a whole life to do one comic strip, yeah. you know, one oh, book. I still look at, like, Jack Kirby, who was putting out yeah. just dozens of pages How every did month. How do that? Uh, yeah, you had inkers and other parts, but still, you had, somebody had to do the actual yeah. drawing. And especially in those old days of Marvel, like 60 years yeah. ago, it was just churning out. Uh, no, yeah. I, I, I just can't imagine. Now that I've tried drawing, I don't understand how people do it professionally, especially that sort of, you uh, know. I don't understand. Yeah. No, the realistic stuff is, yeah. I mean, they're pretty good. I mean, they, they know anatomy and they know what the figure does. Uh, I'm in awe of them, but I, it, I don't want to do it. Yeah. yeah. When did you feel, I, he, I hesitate to use the word, we'll just say competent as an artist. I mean, in the in the book, you've got the story of the the Sinatra cover that kind of yeah. was a, a big step for you. But was there well, a moment I there? learned that I learned that a sketch that you, any artwork that you're not tracing has a no matter how bad the drawing is has a life to it and sometimes has a charm to it that a, a an ambitious traced work doesn't have. I've done some, I've done some Sistine Chapel drawings in my day, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, and and some of them turned out well, but they're they're not funny. They're not charming. They're not. Uh, but uh, they're impressive. Yeah. I don't enjoy. Uh, I, I like the idea that I can do them, but I don't enjoy doing them. I do, the, every now and then, I think of ideas that involve, like for instance, the uh, I did a cover for the New Yorker before before Bill Clinton was inaugurated, mm -hmm. and and I assumed that that he would make a long speech because his speeches were always too long. Yeah. <clears throat> I remember and, his, uh, you know, in conclusion at that, that 1988 uh, uh, Democratic convention where everybody started applauding when <laughs> he said in conclusion because yeah, right. it was finally going to be over. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Well, and so I, I did this. I had this idea that I would do him with all the preview, with every one of the previous presidents in back of him. And that meant doing thirty some odd caricatures and and finding out what they looked like. Who who knew knew what Martin Van Buren looked <laughs> that was like? exactly the one I was going to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, so so I did it, and it was it was a terrific cover, but uh, it was funny, but. With their checking their watches and falling asleep. Yeah, and, yeah. well, as, as you know the story about I, I had Theodore Roosevelt looking at his wristwatch, and the checker at the New Yorker said, uh, "No, men had pocket watches, and in fact they did until the First World War, when they had to throw grenades and look at their watch at the same time." <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, well, I, so I can do these uh, Sistine Chapel things with a lot of people in it, but I really enjoy doing things that I, where I don't have to trace. The, the, the time when I knew I was really good was when I did First Encounters, which my wife wrote. And I, I think... The pictures I did in that book were as good as any I did afterwards or before. Yeah. yeah. What really made it for you? What about those? Well, I mean, yeah. well, I did them every other week for the Atlantic magazine. I was doing them with my wife. It was a labor of love for both of us. As she wrote, she wrote the incident, and I illustrated it. And um, and I had I had two months 
to do it in. I mean, of course, I was doing, I really didn't have two months because I was doing other jobs that had overnight deadlines. Yeah. But, but it meant that I could, uh, that I had the time to do it until it was right. I had the time to do it over when it didn't come out right. right. You don't have that when you have an overnight job, or even it's it's due Tuesday. It's due Tuesday, and there goes the weekend. But uh, and pre-electronic, you know, yeah, you're, you're literally sending things with a courier and waiting yes, for all that time to. Yeah, I would I would give it to a conductor at the uh, at the Brewster station. And tell him to take it down. I'd give him ten dollars to take it to the Bruce to the messenger service in the ground level of Grand Central Station. And one day he forgot the, the picture on the train. And uh, yeah, there, there were there was no internet. There was no FedEx. Uh, and finally, I. I did move into the city five days a week and just went home on the weekend because there was too much to do in the city. But then we all moved into the city and life became wonderful. How's New York changed for you? I mean, it got you, uglier. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, the there's a Hopper painting of uh, a row of a row of red brick three story red brick houses on 6th avenue in Greenwich village well uh, not only do they not exist anymore but 6th avenue isn't is not beautiful anymore yeah. and um, and much of the city isn't beautiful for various reasons there are no more uh, mom and pop stores are gone and chains are are in you don't have a grocery store you have you have yeah. west side market or some other chain and uh and it's crowded you find you you find every now and then you find yourself actually walking in the gutter because the because the the sidewalks are too crowded and 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 suddenly you start remembering the Hollywood versions of Shanghai, uh, yeah. I, uh, which were always too crowded, and uh, but but the energy is in New York, and the funny people are in New York, and um, and people who are who are on the same wavelength that you are in New York. And in the city, we were in the country, we were very happy. But the town we were in always voted Republican. Yeah. And uh, and and even the few friends that you had were were your friends only because they were within ten miles of where you lived. Uh, the city, the city, you choose your friends, and it's easy. They probably live. You can probably find a friend or two in the very building you're living in. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, so that kind of, you miss that, and uh, you miss the bookshops. Well, that that's not that's economic rather than anything else. Amazon came along, and there went the bookshops. Yeah, I didn't yeah. look before coming here. I looked for a coffee place beforehand so I could take care. But usually. When I'm going to a guest's place anywhere in New York, I'll just in case I get there early, I'll look for bookshops in advance uh -huh. to make sure there's somewhere close by I can, uh -huh. you know, hit up because <laughs> that's that's who I am and that's what you end up searching for. That's, there's no nothing more pleasant than spending time in a bookshop. Yeah, but, uh, and always you know seeing books by people I've actually recorded with, which yeah. always makes me feel good. But. Yeah. Um, I was talking or was corresponding with R.O. Blackman, and when you mentioned New Yorker covers, his one question was, why no more New Yorker covers, Ed? So, uh, I know you mentioned it in the book that, you know, you, well, well uh, yeah. I, I, 
just not the if sort I of... tell you the real reason I <laughs> so, sound like a, a terrible elitist and a snob and uh, I'll sound like a terrible person but uh, the truth is there are so few good New Yorker covers now that I mean to the, the I think that I think the first time I sold some, a cartoon to the New Yorker and saw it printed was one of the happiest days of my life. Yeah. I mean, I was in the New Yorker. The New Yorker, I had made one attempt to, at the New Yorker once and, of course, was turned down. But, um, but there was such pride in being in that magazine. It was a civilized magazine. It was beautifully designed. It was, uh, it was meant to be read. And, and you were responsible. You, the cartoonists, were responsible for making it an enjoyable experience. Uh, but uh, the cartoons got lousy. The covers got lousy. And there wasn't much. Uh, I, I mean, you can't you can't w walk into a party and feel that you're you'll be welcome because you have appeared in the New Yorker. Yeah. Uh, that was gone. It it it's ordinary in, in, in a way now. And the cover art, I don't even understand some of them. Uh, and so you know, I feel. It's. I hate to say it, but it's uh, it, it the the pride of being in not only in the New Yorker but in being in most magazines for the cartoonist is gone. Uh, I mean, there are some things that die, like uh, like bushy Burnsides on the face <laughs> or. Uh, you know, as a guy I mean, who's got this giant afro thing going on right now, I understand where you're coming from. But yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah. some some things vanish in the course of civilization's progress, and one of them are are beautiful magazines. Is there a magazine you wish you had appeared in? Had appeared in that you did not appear in, but you wish oh. you had gotten into. No, no. The being in the New Yorker was the height of my ambition. Yeah, uh, I never expected to be in there. I always thought, I always thought that my that my work was far too overworked to be in the New Yorker. They liked they liked a drawing to look ephemeral, to look loose, to look. Uh, yeah, that, that as, style. As, as, as yeah. Though, yeah, yeah, that was their style. Uh, and that was Roz Chast's line when her first thing went in. The, she said that other cartoonists asked Lee Lorenz, do you owe her family money or something? Like, why are you running this woman's cartoon? <laughs> yes, he <laughs> told know. me that Charles Saxon, who I, who I admired, <laughs> uh, was thought little of her. Yeah, yeah, but no, I, I had ecumenical taste. I, I loved a lot of different stuff. But I didn't like uh, <clears throat> I didn't like Mankoff, and I didn't like the guys that he brought into the magazine. And uh, once he became the cartoon editor, I stopped submitting cartoons. I, I was going well. I, I I was 61 when I sold my first cartoon to the New Yorker, mm -hmm. and I uh, and and I. And the first thing that they published, they published as a full page. So I really the went jackpot. in with a yeah. with a storm. Uh, but um, <clears throat> I mean, I I uh, I was also they were giving me when they did give me an assignment, and they weren't giving me many assignments. It was uh, it was to do. Political art. Uh, it was for pol political articles, oh, illustrating an, an Illust existing text. Illus yeah, yeah, it's yeah. To, illustrating a text that was not meant to be funny. Yeah. That was very earnest, explaining a political situation. So suddenly, I was drawing uh, 
Uh, what's the word? I, I wasn't drawing anything amusing or yeah. satirical. I was simply drawing... Like documenting. A, a documentary it? or... Yeah. Uh, it, that's not the word, but no matter. Um, so I, I so I turned down a few of them, and then and then I wanted to write profusely illustrated, and that took me two years. And so I turned down a lot of work, and then, which I suppose I was considered either uninterested or unloyal. So the the assignment stopped coming, and. I was still asked to do covers. Every now and then, the New Yorker had a subject they wanted covered on their cover, so they would send out an email to all their cover artists. And I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to do anything political anymore. I just, you know, that I, you know, for for half a century, I told them what to do, and they didn't listen to me. That's. Uh... A question. Another thing. I was in a conversation with uh, another acquaintance of yours. Just the the role of political cartooning, and whether whether it can make a difference. I mean, it's something I've I've pondered with like conservative, you know, uh, columnists and thinkers who thought they were really pushing conservatism in, you know, these these ways, and they you yeah. know, like, like Andrew Sullivan being focused on getting gay marriage. I'm like, yeah. everything you did still culminated in, in four years of Trump. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, as much uh, as your, your party was, you know, moving yeah. in this direction, you still discovered this is the root uh, of everything. So, yeah, I mean, what are you, having made a career of uh, a half century, like you said, of political cartooning, what good is it? <laughs> I, 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 picked the, I picked the very worst time to decide I didn't want to do any more political stuff. Yeah. Uh, I was doing a monthly thing for Rolling Stone on politics. I stopped that, and that paid well. Uh, and then the New Yorker gave me the, the these things that... Uh, the word I'm looking for is allegory. Ah, allegory. That's the word. Not satire. And you mentioned at some point the like, if it's a political cartoon and you have to label things yeah. in it, that's death. That's death. Yeah. Uh, you're not. I mean, that's what the old-fashioned editorial cartoons did. JQ Public on some man's yeah. sleeve, or a man carrying a briefcase that says "dull care" on it, and yeah, yeah <laughs> all right. those old terms. Exactly. Like, uh, vice. <laughs> 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 right. So if you have to put, if you have to label something, you, you failed, and uh, at, at, at least it can't be funny anyway. Uh, so um, I didn't want to do it anymore, and also, as I started saying. I, I, that happened during the Bush administration. I mean, he was so dumb. He was so incredibly and obviously dumb. He had a dumb face. He couldn't talk. He couldn't. He couldn't talk. He couldn't. And and this is this man was elected twice. And now we look back on him fond, relatively fondly. That's well, he the, wasn't, one of the more messed up things. We actually look back at, you know, all things considered, wasn't as bad as the last well, four years. Well, he didn't want to kill all the black people. Yeah. Uh, so he was a nice guy. Uh, relatively speaking. Yeah. Yes, relatively speaking. Uh, but uh, so I, I said, I, I don't want to do it anymore. Uh, and I, I picked a bad time because Trump was coming. And I just couldn't handle them. As, as I explain in the book, if I if I had the talent of Otto Dix or or George Gross or some of those German expressionists who really knew how how to, how to hit you in the guts, it would have been different. But I, I I don't have that kind of strength. I don't have that kind of vision, and and that was the only kind of way you could handle <laughs> handle Trump. Uh, so I was glad we had Barry Blitt, who at least could. Yes, at least he. Oh, Bar and I think that was another reason I stopped doing covers. I thought Barry Blitt's covers were so great yeah. uh, that uh, 
that I didn't want to, uh, I didn't feel I wanted to compete with him. I was going to lose. I was, I was suddenly going to be the the last kid they pick on the baseball team. <laughs> I'm going all the way back to childhood. That's right. Uh, I was going to be a loser again. Uh, so, um, so I didn't do any covers uh, anymore uh, for for the New Yorker. Uh, but no, he his covers on Trump. I, I didn't have his sensibility. It was just ter- it was perfect for dealing with Trump to get on the New Yorker cover. You couldn't do uh, Kathy Collowitz on the cover of the New Yorker. Yeah. You had to deal with Trump in a witty way, and he knew how to do it. Yeah, uh, yeah he was, he, I, I'm glad we don't have to have those covers now, but I'm yeah. glad he was there <laughs> doing them. <laughs> now, let me ask something from the, the book. You, you mentioned growing beyond particularly David Levine's influence, uh, given, you know, well, the outsized I, I, I never he reached had. David Levine's. No, no, but, but you but, had to get beyond the influence yeah, you had on your, right. your drawing. A, were there other artists also you, you, you know, you saw as those major influences and templates? And B, did you see yourself doing, being that, that figure for younger illustrators over well, the years? I, I grew up with, with, uh, with Gropper, William Gropper. My aunt Jeanette got the Daily Worker, so I saw Gropper in the masses and other magazines, and uh, I, I, I admired him. But my the guy I admired that I could never touch was Felix Topolsky. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you know Felix Topolsky? Not by name, but I'm going to look him up right after. This is the one disadvantage of recording in person is that I can't go over to my laptop and, and type in something. And Oh, yes, no, I know exactly who you're talking about. Felix Sapolsky was yeah. a Polish artist who went to England after Poland fell. And, and he, was able to, he was able to do on-the-spot reportage like nobody who ever lived before. He was able to get caricatures of people on the spot. I mean, he didn't, he didn't do as I frequently have to do, was struggle trying to figure out how to make it, how, where is the funny part of this guy's face. He just, he just drew, drew it, and it came out caricature. And um, I, I admired his stuff so, but it was completely beyond me. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, David Levine, I would, by the way, I was not the only guy influenced by Levine. Oh, I, Levine yeah. had, had, had... Yeah, I'd see his work, you know, all, I'm making a pyramid over, yeah. uh, uh, sign right here. Yeah, that he influenced yeah. a, a ton. Well, of course... It's what killed me about that New York Review of Books documentary on HBO a bunch of years ago. Oh, yeah? They never mentioned Levine. They, like, just as one passing reference... To him, I'm like, you know, what, what was the program about? It was it was all about the history of the New York Review of Books. Oh, and, and they didn't remember. And they, they didn't mention nah, it's all the it's all the writers and the editors. I'm like, yeah, uh, but you know, without Levine, yeah, without Levine, yeah, and as as we now know, because nothing, they, they've used several people. All of them can't compare to him. Yeah. But, but yeah, to, other people were influenced definitely. James McMullen uh, will have or has at this very moment. A picture in the New York Review of Books for the first time, mm-hmm. and it's it's a good it's a good drawing, and uh, I hope they use him again. Uh, but no. Uh, but as far as your position of people who were influenced by you, we'll, we'll put it that way. Um, you know, seeing oh, that influence, I don't think any. Oh, there was one guy who who worked like I did, but. Uh, but we were doing, we had the same methods of working, but he was as, every bit as good as I was. And he, he was terrific. Richard Thompson. Oh, God, I loved Richard. Yeah. Uh, we were supposed to record, but his illness, uh, no, his terrific. illness started to progress. And I was going to go down to Washington for business. And Richard and I were going to get together. And he wrote me just saying, Gil, I'm afraid I sound like a mosquito hitting puberty right now. The, the, ALS is really messing with me. Uh, but is it okay if you recorded my friend Matt instead? I was going to tell him. Matt turned out to be Matt Worker, who had just won the Pulitzer that year for political cartooning. Uh, and I was like, uh, yeah, Richard, 
the consolation prize of the Pulitzer winner in political cartooning is fine. I hope you know you're you're feeling okay. But but that was Richard beyond being a great artist was also a guy who. I was a nobody. I was just some dude with a couple yeah. of microphones, and he felt bad in the middle of everything he was going through and wanted to help me, you yeah. know, have a good conversation with somebody. I only but, met him but, once. Yeah, uh, when I was introduced to him, I kissed his hand. I thought he, I thought he was just terrific. Yeah. It's, it's such a tra- uh, tragedy what I, yeah. what we fell him. Uh, you know, his stuff was it, it, it made you smile just to look at the drawing. Yeah, yeah. There was an exhibition of his stuff in. Um, uh, in Columbus, Ohio, at the Billy Ireland Library, getting to see the next exhibition of Richard's work was just, it's just a joy to see that yeah. stuff. In fact, let me ask, do you, uh, do you like original illustration and cartooning? I, I ask because... Do I collect it? Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, we have your works here reproduced on the, I didn't notice the <laughs> Cardinal Spellman right next to us this whole time. Um you know, uh, many years ago, I was recording with Ben Catcher, and to Ben, the, his work, he says, is just printer's instructions. It's comics, but it's just the reproduction is what matters to him, seeing it in print or seeing it as its its final. To you, is the does the reproduction match the original piece of art? Generally, very, does, often, does it very often it does, but. I love looking at originals. Yeah, I, I love looking at my own originals, and uh, uh, every now and then, when I can't do a drawing, I walk down my my hallway where I have my pictures. Everything, and I everything is down this hallway. Everyone, you got to check this out someday. Break into his house and look at this art. Sorry, go on, go on. Yeah. So <laughs> you know, I I, I, I will walk down the hallway to convince myself that I know I I do know how to draw. I haven't forgotten. But, uh, yeah, looking at the originals is very reassuring. Uh, it's, um, I, str- I struggle a lot. I, yeah. I, I don't know why. Uh, sometimes, I, I once did a drawing over completely over for Vanity Fair. And then I went into my friend's house, apartment, where I gave him the original that I decided wasn't good enough. And I looked at it and I said, that's a good drawing. Why why did I do it over? This I've discovered. Again, I only took up drawing this year. I've discovered they somehow get better overnight. As (laughs) bad as you feel about them, I look at things the next day, I'm like, oh. Not so that was bad. actually pretty good. Now that yeah, I, I look at right. it, when I was focused on it, and, and yeah. Really, yeah, it just yeah. you see the flaws much more than the uh, the virtues. Yeah, you, you you do know what went wrong, what you did wrong in an illustration, even one that's been printed and admired. And I said, if only I hadn't done. Yeah, that. do you cringe over over yeah. some old work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well yeah, I, we all do. We'll but, go into it. Yeah. <laughs> We won't go into it. Let, well, let me be like all all the friends who told you to come to see me. Let me tell you who, who to go see. Well, you've seen John Cuneo, whose work I admire, and uh, you should see uh, you should see James McMullen. Who I was, was going to ask. I'm going to get a connection from. I, I wrote him down at the very beginning. I was like, oh yeah, McMullen. Right? That's somebody I have yeah, to sit down he, with. Yeah, he's very articulate, and he doesn't stutter the way I do. And, um, well, there aren't too many guys left because we're dying like, like flies. You've spoken to Seymour, Seymour yeah. Quest. Seymour was very interesting because he doesn't look, he did not look back. He, he only kept look, talking about what he was working on and really yeah. didn't want to talk about the past past. Oh, all right. Yeah, it was interesting. I mentioned that to Stephen Heller once and he's like, yeah, he's... He's focused on what he's doing next. It's always, you know, how can I keep making new uh-huh. art? So, uh-huh. but uh, yeah, Heller's well, another one I've gotten to, to sit down with a few times now. And, and well, I, I, I can tell you right now, all I'm focused on is getting back to doing my literati on the last page of the New York Times book review. I've been. I had been doing them once a month before I started working on the book, and I want to go back to doing them once a month. Uh, I, 
I like it because I'm writing as well as illustrating, and they're fun to do. Uh, writers are almost as crazy as composers. By comparison to composers or writers, artists are relatively sane. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. You know, uh, my experience over over yeah, this time, I did the, tell you that Cuneo might be the most neurotic person I've ever recorded yeah. with, but that's a, an yeah, outlier, but, thankfully. Yeah, but he'd be neurotic <laughs> even if he... Oh, he was a plumber. He would have been just yeah, as crazy. Yeah. yeah, he would have been the same <laughs> way. But, uh, yeah, artists are dealing with something concrete. They they can look at it. They You put something on paper and or on canvas, and there it is. Our composers are, are, are dealing with something that they hear in their head. It doesn't exist. There's nothing there. And uh, and what they want to create is ephemeral. You, you, you can't yeah. just you look at the whole thing. You, yeah. you're, you're still experiencing it yeah. linearly. Yeah. I mean, you can't... Uh, and nobody... And, and people accept it even though they don't know exactly what that music is supposed to mean. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Uh, it's all emotion, and um, so so artists aren't that crazy. And uh, what was the other composer? Oh, writers. Yeah, writers. Well, there are so many ways to say something. How did you wonder how how people wrote before there was word, uh, uh, not word processors. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, the whole key, the computer, the whole setup, computer you know, doing thing, everything longhand, where, where you can change so easily. You don't have to scratch out and start all over on a typewriter or something. <clears throat> there is just too many choices uh, when you're writing, and uh, and it's very hard. I, I I'm not an intellectual. I, I'm guided by emotions, uh, but. Uh, do you feel that's reflected in your line? Uh, what? Do you feel that's reflected? Yeah. I mean, in, if, in, in everything we're looking if, at here? If, if yeah. that, my best drawings show nervous energy. And uh, You're glad that's a direction you never went down? I mean, beyond just the... It's, it's, not, a, it's yeah. not a question of choice. You, you either... You're either intrigued by... The mind. And, oh, I'm thinking uh, more with the other forms. The, the way like Pfeiffer went into to theater, or writing for theater, and then then movies and Blackman uh, making animation. Yeah. Had those other forms ever really interested you, or were you? Yes, I wanted to, I wanted to write a musical, and uh, I, I'm I even convinced some some composer, a lyricist and composer to to do a musical out of my uh, Mary Astor book. And, and they have, and they're trying to find backers for mm -hmm. the uh, musical on Mary Astor's Purple Diary. Yes, uh, I, yes, I, I always... Uh, if I had known that I, I could write, I would have started writing a lot sooner. <laughs> well, you're a patron saint of late starters, as you've as you've said. Yeah. Did you feel that ninety was was too early to start a memoir? Also, or, or <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that's just about when I started was when I was ninety. Yeah. No, it. Did you think about it, putting it off a few years? Or you know, the you thing, know? the thing, of, the reason that everybody doesn't become an artist or a writer or a composer. Is because people are afraid of failing, and and some people can do other things. The truth of the matter is, I couldn't do anything except draw. It was the only thing I was good at. I was a lousy student. I didn't like reading. I didn't like doing my homework. I I I I, I just I just wanted to make pictures, and. Uh, and other people can do other things, and and there are things where you don't fail, mm -hmm. uh, like being a stock stock market broker. I yeah. mean, yeah, you can make bad decisions, but they're not. You, I don't know. They don't reflect somehow. somehow yeah, people fail up. They'll, they'll, yes. they'll keep screwing and, up and get higher and higher jobs. And God but, knows people fail up in politics. God, that all they do is fail and get and get more important and more powerful. 
So uh, I failed a lot, and and not every artist does that. Milton Glaser had had enormous confidence in himself, and he never accepted the fact that any of his drawings were bad. Uh, they were they all you know. It's my art. Some some are better than others. So what what difference does it make? Uh, and uh, he just I when we worked together, I I remember his unconscious act when he had a new job. He would stand and look down on it. Sometimes it was only uh, the briefest sketch, or, or he would look at the reference he was going to use. But he would just stand up and rub his hands like a villain in a silent movie, <laughs> like he was going to rape the woman he had tied on the tracks of the yeah. train. Uh, and uh, he had that delight in what he was going to do. I, on the other hand, always approach every job I'm doing as, I don't think I can do this. Yeah. It's beyond me. Uh, and that was the difference. Uh, uh, I, I, somehow we both, we both produced good work, but, but, he, but he didn't lose sleep over it somehow. Yeah. Did you guys stay? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah I know no, there was, we did stay friends. You know, I mean, we weren't, we weren't you close friends. You left but it was a different scenario. Yeah, he, uh, yeah. Milton... Uh, I, I wasn't. Uh, we weren't close friends, but we enjoyed seeing each other from time to time. Yeah, and um, I'm sure as as life goes on and there's fewer and fewer people, there's also that sense of, you know, we're the only guys. Yeah, around. We, we went through a lot. And yeah. He, I mean, uh, he he was when when he became art director of of New York Magazine. He made me a contributing editor, which I was very grateful for. And, uh, yeah, uh, Seymour, Seymour and I stayed friends. We weren't, we didn't stay as close as we were at one point, but I loved Seymour and, uh, he was a good guy. And we stay, I, I, there are very few people very few friendships I had that ended badly. Very few. So I'm hoping you won't shout at me by the end of this one, so we'll, we'll be good. But to get back to the question on political cartooning and whether it can really make a change. I, I was thinking of the, the documentary your son did about you about 10 years ago, where Jules Pfeiffer makes a comment that the the political cartooning wasn't meant to change minds. It was meant to, you know, almost provide solace to people who... Yes, did, yes. did you feel that the, the same thing, that it exactly was... Exactly the same yeah. thing. It was, just to, it was just to assure the people who thought, as you do, that you were not crazy, and there were others out there who thought exactly the way you did. Uh, and it was a solace. Uh, uh, I mean, not... That, not that I was a solace to them, but other artists were a solace to me uh, to know that they felt as I did. Do you think you would have been doing political cartooning had you not grown up in that particular era? Well, I know you, how inextricable that all I is. I think but, instead yeah. of that particular era, you might say, you know, I don't think the particular era. I mean, of course, nobody had money and some were starving, but... Uh, but it wasn't the fact that it was a depression. I think, I think it had more to do with the fact that I hated my father, which I'm, <laughs> which I'm enough of, uh, I'm enough of a believer in psychoanalysis to believe that uh, that my distrust of authority came from the fact that I had an extremely stupid father. Yeah. So uh, and. Uh, so uh, I think that had as much to do with uh, with my anger, but I was also, as you as you know, brought up in a family that was left wing. Uh, a couple of my aunts were uh, were 
thought of themselves as communists and some were members of the party. And, um, and so I knew that there was, I was attuned to the uh, injustices in the world. And, uh, and they made me angry and, uh, and I suppose that explains. But you know, uh, I, I don't want to give the impression that I, that I gave myself as you have given yourself over to what you love to do. I, I, and I loved to do my political stuff. But I wasn't going to do my political stuff if it wasn't if it meant that I wouldn't make enough money to support my family. Yeah. So I did a lot of commercial stuff. I did not feel uh, uh, particularly guilty about doing advertising for banks if it uh, if it allowed me to do work for the nation. So I'm a uh, lobbyist for pharmaceutical companies. So yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> we all have to do things to. Yes, to and yeah. I understand. I, I mean, there were left wingers who wrote to the nation once. Uh, why do Why do you Why do you hire? I did a cartoon that the feminists got upset about, and and one of them wrote, "Why do you Why do you let a hack who works for banks do cartoons for you?" So. Uh, I, I said, well, you know, the, some some readers think it's criminal to uh, to work for banks. Uh, uh, my accountant thinks it's criminal to work for the nation. So, uh, so um, yeah, I, I I mean, I don't want anybody to think that I'm some kind of working class hero. I am not Bruce Springsteen, who somehow has done well being a, uh, yeah. <laughs> a, a, a fighter for the glory of mankind. But um, I, I, I wanted to have a happy life. I, if I had a choice between having a happy life and selling out, I'll pick selling out. I wanted yeah. uh, I wanted a happy life. I remember Bert Bacharach many years ago. Would someone asked him after all the the great musical education you had, why weren't you composing classical music like uh, you trained in? He said, "I like fresh squeezed orange juice. You know, <laughs> I, I like to." to and that was his thing. I'll, I'll, I'll make Bert Bacharach music instead because yeah. well, I get to live here in Malibu, and you know. Yes, and when in the dear dear Miss. Days when advertising agencies used comic art to sell their product, whether it was insecticide, which Dr. Seuss did with yeah. his flint. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yes, I, I, I was a sellout by some standards, but I, I wanted to be happy. And I, uh, I, and I, by and large, considering what a grumpy, angry man I am, uh, I did lead a, lead a happy life. Yeah. And I met one of your, your kids who seemed pretty, I'll say well-adjusted and, and, you know, didn't, you know, didn't look at you the way you seemed to look at your father. And that's, that's no, an improvement oh, on, no. on life. So my, my son has been a savior to me. I, I call him twice a day because I can't do something on the internet. And he guides me through yeah. what to do. And he's very patient with me. He never loses his temper with me. Uh, and I'm really kind of stupid when it comes to the <laughs> yeah. computer. Things, things are advancing far too quickly for us. Uh, let me ask you about political cartooning. It's something that came up when I, I recorded with Martin Rosen in, in England years ago. You run into a circumstance where an, a, a politician you loathe and detest, uh, that you loathe and detest, wants to buy one of your, <laughs> your drawings of them? And, and have you run into, I'm sure Levine had that as, as a, you know, I think LBJ wanted something that Levine's like, you know, this doesn't reflect well on you. I don't know why you want to buy it. But did you run into anything like that over the years? Uh, yeah, the Library of Congress wanted to buy something of mine. And uh, yeah, but that's different than a politician you hate saying. Oh, you know. It was Barry Goldwater. Barry <laughs> Goldwater wanted a Barry. Yeah. I, 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 I did. I, I did a series of monuments for our times, 
And I had Barry Goldwater as a medieval warrior, except that he was riding, he was riding his horse backwards. I mean, he had, he, he was facing its ass rather than its head. And, uh, and he wanted to buy it. He thought it was very funny. I didn't want to sell it to him. And I didn't want to sell, and his family wanted, uh, uh, not his family, but the guy who the guy who was turned down for the Supreme Court. Bork, yeah. Bork. I did I did a I did a cartoon, a caricature of Bork, which I thought was a devastating caricature on the cover of the of the nation. And he wanted to buy it and I didn't want to sell it to him. Yeah, so I wonder, you know, do you when we talk about selling out, you know, there, there's a more literal version of, you know, I will literally sell a piece of art to someone I hate of them. But, you know. Well, you know, you can just any, justify anything. I remember walking into to Milton Glazer's studio and he, what he was doing, he was doing the design for a pack of cigarettes for a German company. So... So I said, Milton, how can you how can you do how can you do that? I mean, this was at a time when we all knew what cigarettes did. Yeah. He said, "How can you do a package of cigarettes?" He says, it, "It's for Germans." <laughs> <laughs> Along the same lines, have you wound up in a room, you know, being introduced to someone who you have caricatured viciously? I, I, and I, how I uncomfortable did, I is did, I did avoid that. I, I yeah. had. I had done a a cartoon about Arthur Schlesinger Jr. before I ever met him. <clears throat> Actually, he turned out to be uh, he turned out to do a good deed for my wife. He gave her he gave my wife's book a very <clears throat> a very favorable blurb. Mm -hmm. But before I knew him, I I I objected to. I, oh, I think you know he. Had, he had said when Eisenhower said uh, had mentioned the industrial the military, military industrial yeah. complex for the first time, uh, Arthur Schlesinger said, that "I'm sure he didn't know what. I'm sure it was just a speech written to him by one of his speechwriters, because I'm sure he doesn't even know what it means." Uh, which, uh, and I thought, you know. That's nonsense, and uh, and I did, and it was some, it was for something for Esquire, and and I and Robert Manning, who was editor of the Atlantic, in which is in Boston, who came to New York, he was a member of the Century Club, and took me to the Century Club for the first time. I had never been in the Century Club. I didn't know such places like that yeah. existed in New York. <laughs> Uh, Especially childhood, you had, you know. Yes, yes, but it was just the most wonderful place. And while we were walking there, he suddenly, he suddenly sees Arthur Schlesinger, and he goes to meet him. And rather than follow him, I hid behind the pillar. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, but no, I, I, I can't think. I, Offhand, I can't think of of having actually met one of the people I caricature. Yeah. Oh yes, I did. I mean, uh, but it, it was all friendly. I, I, uh, I, when I did the mural for the Waverly Inn for for Graydon Carter, and I wanted to put uh, I wanted to put my friend Bud Trillin in the mural because the mural was going to be made up of all the people who lived in Greenwich Village and uh, and I showed him the sketch with Trillin in it and he said no no don't no instead of Trillin put in uh, put in Fran Leibowitz do you notice I'm, I was able to remember two names in a row very good I'm, I'm impressed uh, <laughs> So, uh, so I put in Fran Leibowitz, and uh, and then I met her at 
in the Waverly and when she was sitting right under her caricature of herself. So that was very pleasant. And, uh, and in spite of... Uh, I mean, she, Not getting she to put friendly. in who you wanted, though. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I... No, I haven't... I can't recall meeting somebody that I've devastated yeah. or thought I devastated. In, fa- in point of fact, as far as I can see, I never devastated anybody. <laughs> I mean, Truman Capote at least has the the knowledge that his portrait of the Vanderbilt lady who killed her husband actually committed suicide after his piece in Esquire appeared. Uh, nobody yeah. ever killed themselves because of my cartoon. Yeah, I had a another pharmaceutical association refer to me as that pain in our ass, Gil Roth, at a at a big public event once, and I thought. I've earned that. It's a long story, but I, I really did earn that that nomenclature. That was the uh, you yeah, know I was a massive pain in their ass. I, I, so what, what? How how were you a pain in their ass? Oh, uh, I almost destroyed the generic drug program in America by accident uh, about five years ago. It was this giant multi billion dollar negotiation, and I had never negotiated a car price before this, much less you know how the FDA is going to get funded to review generic drugs. And um, some things went off the rails, and we almost ended up um, not being able to fund the FDA for a couple of years. But it all worked out. Everything was fine. But at their trade show uh, a year later, I was referred to as that pain in our ass, Gil Roth. So mm. everything worked through. I, I got a good deal for the companies I represent, and things are more equitable now. But uh, yeah, I was eh, in over my head. But, you know, again, um, yeah, every now and then one does get over one's head. Yeah, it, it worked out for the best. I still managed to get the show out on time every week, uh, the podcast, despite yeah. having all that pressure up above me. Um, but there's a, a thing that I've, I've, I've wanted to ask you about just um, because the longer an artist has been practicing, the more often this comes up. Are there tools of your art that you either you, you absolutely swear by or things you can't find now that, that, you know, this oh, was the, oh. the nib or this was the paper uh, or no, craft. The, yeah. Well, yes. As a matter of fact, there is, I, most of my ambitious drawings are done uh, because I have to trace them in some way or another uh, done on 18, 16 or 18 pound bond papers. And they used to make bond paper in two, uh, three sizes, two of which were 14 by 17 or 18 by 24, 19 by 24. And the 19 by 24 pads were what I would use when I had to do a, a mural or I had to do a picture that involved many, many caricatures and so that the faces, I had to have enough space to yeah. do the caricatures. Uh, and, and suddenly, last year, I found out that they have stopped making the 18 by, the 19 by 24 pads in, yeah. in bond paper. You can get 19 by 24 pads in ledger bond, in in Bristol paper, in this paper, but you can't get them anymore in 19 by 24. So I will never be able to do another mural, another, yeah. uh, another... Your Sistine Chapel. That's a- <laughs> another Sistine Chapel, uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and I'm limited now to 14 by 17, which is barely big enough for me to do the back page of the New York Times, but just big enough. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, they could, these, these art manufacturers, these paint manufacturers can put you out of business. David Levine once said to me that if, if they ever stop making the watercolor paper that he uses, he'd have to go out of business. And, uh, and I think Jim has some kind of water paper, watercolor paper. Yeah, that's what that I wonder. How, can. how, you know, how it, focused do you get on these are the right tools? These this are is what the I know right how to tools? work with. Right, yeah. right, right. And uh, I, 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 I don't have to worry about my. You have to trust me. These pens I have just for regular writing. 
I have six boxes of these at home on because the off they chance they end stop up. making. Yep. Them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, keep piling them up. But, yeah. Well, I won't say. I, I have uh, I have a couple of hundred speedball uh, B six speedball pen points, mm -hmm. which are which allow me to do my drawings in a way somewhat different from anybody else's because everybody else is using a sharp pointed thing. Uh, speedballs have a round point. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if speedball goes out of business, all I have to do is clean up these pen points and yeah. use them over and over again. Besides which, I'm uh, at 92. I don't have to worry too much about running out of pen points. Yeah. Uh, in fact, when I when I recently bought a package of Crest toothpaste and it had, I don't know, it had I think nine or twelve in a package, I began to wonder whether this is more than a lifetime supply. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, you, you do, do you find think yourself it. thinking about death? I, I find myself thinking uh, when I have a cold, as yeah. I do at the moment, and which is why I sound like Walter Brennan. Yeah. Uh, it gets a character. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I do find myself wondering, is there really that much need to continue if, I, if I'm going to feel lousy like this? But, uh, but most of the time, if I don't have a cold, I really feel pretty good. Yeah. And it's just, I, I just wonder, as a guy who got a leukemia diagnosis several months ago, which will probably not be life-threatening for a very long time, blah, 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 um, you know, that the mortality thing suddenly came to the fore yeah. for me in a way it, it really hadn't previously. And I just had no idea... Most creators I have recorded with who are around your age, and there have been five or six now, no one seems to have a, oh, yes, the dark specter is lurking behind me. It's always a, yeah, I'm still making stuff. I don't have time for this. I'm just going to keep making more art. So, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, I can conceive of, no, I really can't. I really can't conceive of not ever drawing. Yeah. Uh, so, uh but I, I'm, I'm not ambitious in the way that I was when I was young. I, but you found a new new between this and the Mary Astor book, you found this illustration and prose balance that yeah. you know, is new for you, and just like Pfeiffer discovering graphic novels in his, his later days. Well, actually, uh, uh, Jules's first novel, The Trouble with Harry, was. Um, no, it wasn't The Trouble with Harry. It was something else with Harry. Uh, yeah, uh, Harry the Rat. Harry the Rat Yeah, with something women. like that. Yeah, 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 that's it. Harry yeah. the Rat with Women. Yeah, I can visualize yeah. it on my bookshelf because, yeah. of course. Yeah. As, as usual, I'm thinking of a movie rather than a book. But uh, uh, he, that, he did that when he was quite young. And Jules is a little bit in the in the Milton Glaser mold that, that it never occurs to him that he's going to fail. It occurred to him, he knew that his drawing, those first drawings that he did in the Village Voice were really bad. Uh, and he knew that they weren't good enough, but he became, he became the Jules Pfeiffer that we love very quickly. I mean, his, Jules, it's, and, and both, both Jules and I are unathletic, and uh, but Jules has enormous confidence in himself. Uh, I'm, I'm the, I'm, I worry all the time, but Jules has a tremendous confidence in himself and a tremendous energy. The drawings, his his drawings, and most of which are really uh, un, untraced. I think uh, have enormous energy and. Uh, that's why I love them. But for yourself, again, like you've done now two books that are, again, working in prose. You discovered that you can write, write with illustration. You know, is that your, do you consider that your, you know, your form going forward? Or do you have an idea for another project, essentially? Or do you really want to focus I, with the New York Times? I, don't think, I don't think I have enough energy left for another book. But who knows? I might. I uh, I, uh, and were there any 
models or, you know, was there another example of this form that sort of inspired or, or gave you a no, template? No, I didn't have any. any I, I've never read anything like what I never read a book like Mary Astor's Purple Diary. Yeah, right? so I wondered if there was a, an example that you had. No, oh, I'd I, like to do something in this vein. But No, yeah. I mean, whoever, whoever dreamed of somebody writing a a personal history just because they're a fan of a magazine. I mean, a, a fan of a movie star. Uh, but a minor, uh, not a minor, but a, a weird movie star, like not the biggest thing in the world. Yeah, but, yeah, I mean... Uh, I, it's such a wonderful book for that, you know. It, it's oh, Well, it's, she was, well, you know, I, I saw her when she was... I saw her in 1939 in... in uh, in the prisoner of Zender, and she was the most beautiful, this beautiful person I had ever seen in my life. She was even more beautiful than my mother, which, who was pretty beautiful, and uh, and uh, and for some reason, I stayed in love with her. As uh, of course, I played up the crazy old man who's in love with a uh, yeah. supporting movie actress, but. Uh, so I, n nobody's going to write a book like that. I'm not sure I could do it again. Yeah. My love affair with Jean Autry. <laughs> <laughs> again, I wouldn't put anything past you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I just wondered if there was, you know, that 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 I don't even know what number act it would be for you. Third act, fourth act, whatever. That you know, it turns out this is what I really meant to be I doing like all writing. these years. I, yeah. I like writing, and I like the, the struggle of writing too. I like the way it keeps getting better and better. It's like it's like doing a pastel drawing, which is gets better and better as you keep working on it, uh, as opposed to pen and ink, which. The more you work on it, the worse it gets. <laughs> and I've learned that as part of my very short education in art. Yeah, if, if you keep making more lines, it no, just does no, not no. go well for you. <laughs> no. And my way of avoiding it was, instead of cross-hatching, to scribble. If you, if you scribble, you can't over-scribble. Somehow you just can't. Uh... I'd say you can't. I can find a way, but you, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, uh, well, when you when you work in pen and ink, do you yeah. cross hatch or do you scribble? Uh, generally scribbling because scribbling helps me cover up. And I'll show you some <clears throat> some oh, awful yeah. sketches oh, okay. uh, after this. But but yeah, it helps me cover up anything I screwed up with. Just ah, okay, it, it's a sketchier sort of work as uh -huh. opposed to yeah. a couple of things that have done very very fine lines and cross hatching, and it's just people. I know a general audience is not going to get it. I know all my cartooning pals are going to say, yeah, Gil's, Gil's faking it right here. He yeah, doesn't know yeah. what he's doing, and that's why yeah. the light looks wrong. Yeah. This, this, you know. Well, a lot, of, a lot of terrific artists covered up their mistakes that way, too. Yeah. That's the fun of looking at originals, again, like you were, yeah. you were saying. Let me ask sort of a last question, I guess, about Profusely Illustrated. Yeah, and, and you mentioned how it started as a, you know, it was supposed to be a political book that became memoir uh, at your editor's suggestion. Were there things you learned about yourself in telling the, the, the life stories that were in there? Well, look, uh, I didn't lie about anything, but I, I left out stuff. My first wife is the mother of my two children. The, the son that you met here is, yeah. is an issue of my first wife. And I wasn't, and my, and my first marriage ended in an unfortunate way. And I wasn't going to in any way uh, denigrate my first wife be yeah. Because it is, first of all, it isn't in my nature to be cruel, and uh, well, I, that's an overstatement. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to let you feed yourself on that one. You know, but, I, I, I take that back, but I certainly didn't want to be cruel to my first wife. Hurtful uh, is different than cruel. Yeah, yes. maybe that's. And yeah. I and so, 
there was stuff that was left out. I had my children to consider who loved their mother. <laughs> and uh, so there was that. But that act of retrospection, of looking back at your life, were there aspects of it that you hadn't really considered? I, I am so... I'm, I was so surprised at, at how well my wife, my life went. Yeah. Uh, well, I said my wife went. What no. I was thinking of, I was so extremely happy in my second marriage. It, it, you convey it so beautifully in I the, can't, the book. I yeah. can't believe that I was that lucky. Uh, I'm not. A, uh, I'm not a teddy bear. I'm not a, a cozy fuzzy, warm person. Uh, I, I, I don't deal with people terribly well. I, 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 I was just lucky at the life I led. My, my wife taught me when somebody says nice about your work, you say thank you. You don't explain to them why the drawing was lousy. <laughs> I, I know exactly where you're coming from. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so she, uh, you know, so my years with her were, were just wonderful, yeah. and and I got, I got more fame, and did work that I loved. I got more fame than I ever dreamed of. I didn't think, I I thought I was lucky just not be becoming a door to door salesman. Uh, uh, so. You know, I was just lucky to meet, lucky that I talked Seymour into starting a studio, lucky that a lot of things happened just the right way. Uh, I, I, it was only by dint of determined determination that I managed to stay an angry man about <laughs> politics all my life because my life has ended so well. Four children. None of them none of them joined a church. None of them none of them <laughs> I were, thought you were gonna say cult, but yeah, no for yeah, you church cult, is bad yes. enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> none of them none of them are into drugs. none of them think that their father's a stupid square. Uh, you know, they're, they're gentle, good kids, all four of them. And and what are the chances of that happening? Four out of four, and they're all, all good kids. So, you know. Yeah. And did you keep them out of the family business? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of them, one of them went into the family business in a small way, but she's, but she. I saw a couple of her pieces on the, the yes, walls and, over there, and they're yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. You know, but there wasn't, there was no longer a place for her beautiful, sensitive, still lives or her beautiful drawings of happy people. I mean, uh, she, she, she was just too, too, she's too sweet a person to do angry stuff like her father. Uh, so, you know, it's all, been, it's all been a great ride. On the strength of that, Ed, thanks so much for coming on. This has been wonderful. And I hope we can get together. We'll, we'll make it a date for next year if you're, you're up for it. Yeah, sure. I, I, maybe I'll have another book by that time. And that was Ed Sorrell. Go check out his wonderful new book, Profusely Illustrated, a memoir from Knopf. Just came out uh, Thanksgiving week. Well, Thanksgiving week 2021 for you time travelers out there. Uh, Ed does have an Instagram feed at Edward Sorrell Studio. Uh, and you should also check out his website, Edward Sorrell, uh, to see more about his art, read a longer bio of his and, and come to understand just what amazing work this guy has done for so, so many years. Now, that is E-D-W-A-R-D-S-O-R-E-L dot com. And there'll be links to that in the Instagram feed in the show and episode notes for this one. Oh, also, go get Ed's previous book, Mary Astor's Purple Diary, which I'm pretty sure you will love. Uh, thanks again to Ed, to his son, who also helped out with this one. And like I said at the end of the intro, to Graydon Carter for... Um, reminding me not to take no for an answer. 
Now, uh, you can support the Virtual Memory Show by telling other people about it. Uh, let them know there's this guy in New Jersey who just sits down and has a neat conversation with writers, artists, and other creative people every single week. Um, you can also tell me what you like and don't like about the show and who you'd like to hear me record with or what movie or TV show or book or comic or piece of theater or music you think I should turn listeners on to. You can do that by email, by postcard or letter. I always like the postcards. Or by leaving a message on my Google Voice number, which is 973 869 nine six five nine that goes directly to voicemail so you don't have to worry about me picking up and getting stuck in a long and arduous conversation um but the messages can only be three minutes in length so keep that in mind and let me know if it's cool to run your message in an upcoming episode of the show i won't do it without your approval now if you have money to spare uh don't give it to me i'm doing just fine what i hope you'll do is support individuals and institutions in need there are ways through like gofundme patreon kickstarter indiegogo and other crowdfunding uh, mechanisms or platforms where you can find people who either need you know assistance with you know medical or you know housing or art projects um but there are a lot of ways that you can help people in need. Now, uh, when it comes to institutions or foundations, uh, you can look to your local food bank, the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds, Election Funds. There are a lot of things you can do to, to help us work towards a better world. So um, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading. Keep making art and keep the conversation going.